Good morning, Rodrigo. I think now you can get the audio. You can get the oh. audio. Yes, I can. I can. It's quite uh, clear. Thank you. Everyone is muted. That's why it's coming like that. Don't worry. We are all on. Okay. Uh, just for everyone's information, I'm sorry for the delay, but Mr. Amandeep Singh is just finding some trouble getting into the Cisco platform. So I'm just trying to get him in. Please uh, bear with me for a few minutes. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mahesh Kale, can you hear me?
good afternoon everyone uh, i think uh, i'm getting a lot of queries on the audio there is no audio problem the audio is on only that everyone is muted waiting for the chairman of our uh, exports and uh, international committee to come online uh, rest all the panelists are already there and i welcome everyone on behalf of sidm uh, if you can hear me mr rodrigo yeah so everyone everyone is on so don't worry on the uh, uh, on on the audio part especially the attendees who can't actually speak uh, because uh, this uh, the platform is like that so i'm getting uh, all these queries on my uh, on on my whatsapp so the short answer is just a few minutes and we start
uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. So again, apologies uh, for the delay. Uh, the chairman of the international uh, committee, uh, Ms. Amandeep Singh, he's just having some trouble getting into uh, the Cisco uh, platform, but we are finding a way around it. Uh, so he should be on in the next, definitely in the next uh, a few minutes. Uh, so uh, before that, uh, and uh, uh, up in that happens, I just like to welcome everyone uh, and on uh, uh, behalf of SIDM, I'm Abhnish. Uh, I take care of uh, the international affairs over here. And uh, today we have a very interesting uh, discussion on the global uh, uh, defense industry on how COVID uh, has impacted uh, the entire industry. So uh, um, on the panel, of course, we have uh, Mr. Amandeep Singh, who is our chairman uh, of the SIDM International Expos Committee. And we have Mr. Manfred Hader, Global Head, AND, Roland Berger. Mr. Rahul Gangal, Partner, AND, Asia, North America, Roland Berger. Mr. Aditya Kumar, Senior Project Manager, Roland Berger. Commodore Bunty Sethi, Defense Advisor, UKIBC. Mr. R Rodrigo Mudugno, Director, Abinde, which is the uh, Brazilian Defense Industry Association and uh, Brigadier Ashish Dharacharya, Senior Advisor, SIDM. Uh, Avnish? Yes. I have uh, Mr. Amandeep Singh on the uh, on the mobile with me and uh, we will start the proceedings with the opening remarks. Over to him. Yeah, Mr. Amandeep. Yeah. So Manfred Hader, Global Head, Aerospace and Defense, Ronald Berger, Commodore Bunting Safety Advisor, UKIBC, Mr. Rodrigo Moduno, Director of ABI MDE, Brigadier Ashish Bhattacharya, Senior Advisor, SIDM, participants and friends from the industry. A very good afternoon. At the very outset, it's a privilege for me to address this webinar on the impact of COVID-19 on the global defense and aerospace industry. I'm happy that our MOU partners today ABIMDE and UKIBC will be sharing their perspective as well. I also thank Ronald Berger for partnering with SIDM to conceptualize this webinar. I'm sorry I'm not able to, have not been able to get on to the uh, web, uh, which I think I should be doing very shortly, and hence I am addressing you through this uh, phone call. Friends, as chairman of SIDM, the International and Export Committee, has always been our endeavor to put both Indian industry's capability and strength in front of the world market. In the past couple of years, in line with the uh, government's vision to expand India's defense sector by boosting exports to rupees 35,000 crore, SITM has been working extensively to expand the industry's global footprint by engaging with its counterpart of organization and Indian mission abroad to seminars, delegations, and interacting with countries which have a strong defense market. At Defense Expo 2020, we engaged with Russia, the Republic of Korea, and France, among other countries, by organizing focused seminars to strengthen bilateral defense trade. Besides, an exclusive expo seminar was organized to emphasize on the need to build defense exports to achieve a 26 billion dollar defense industry, Indian defense industry by 2025. According to the recent data published on 14th April by the Department of Defense Production of India, the vast majority of defense export approvals have been secured by the private sector. They also show that the private sector's growth in exports has increased strongly in recent years. For instance, in FY 2019-20, India's private sector was attributed with 93% of defense exports approval in terms of value, with the remainders having been secured by the uh, DPSUs. In previous year, that is fiscal year 1819, the private sector secured 89% of all export exports. To capitalize on this momentum, the DDP has set a target of achieving rupees 15,000 crore worth of exports in current financial year, that is 2021. However, as you are all aware, the unfortunate event of COVID-19 on the global arena has necessitated a recast of steps. All world economies are bound to be adversely affected. International travel and movement of goods is heavily restricted as of now. Defense expositions are likely to take a back seat. 
prominent exhibitions such as Eurosatry and Panpro show have already been cancelled. Others are likely to follow. However, current circumstances has also presented an opportunity for India. One, India has so managed the situation better than some of other countries. Two, there are a lot of countries and companies which are looking at alternate, which are today looking at alternate to China for their supply chain. This puts India in a sort of a sweet spot which we have to work for and capitalize. In this scenario, today's webinar becomes apt to understand the landscape of the effects of COVID on the defense and aerospace industry. I'm confident that through this webinar, the industry will be able to watch forthcoming challenges and take necessary action to mitigate difficulties. I'm sure that in coming time, through the effective participation of SITM members, we will be able to resolve problems collectively by engaging with all stakeholders. In this light, I encourage members to share their concerns related to exports with the SIDM Secretariat so that these issues can be addressed to the MOD. Lastly, I would like to re-emphasize that SIDM and its Secretariat stand committed to helping the industry re-achieve its growth in exports. Thank you all and Jai Hind. Thank you, uh, Chairman, uh, for those comments. Uh, now I would request uh, uh, Mr. Manfred, Aditya, and Rahul to uh, start with their presentation. So I'm just, Hi, this uh, is Rahul. So if, if you can put Mr. up can the presentation, the please. Yeah, can you just make me the... At least I'm just waiting for you to give me permission to upload. You are the uh, uh, just a second. Yeah, this is now the presenter. Okay. Okay, perfect. Uh, I hope I'm audible. Yes. 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 Okay. Uh, let me first begin by thanking all of you to have participated in this. Uh, in this webinar, it's timely, as the Honorable Chairman mentioned. We are proud to bring forth our global perspective here. Um, I am sure we've engaged with some of you uh, on one-to-one -one discussions, but as a firm, we are one of the top-tier strategy consulting firms, the only one of European origin. Uh, we bring possibly uh, one of the strongest teams uh, in the aerospace defense sector globally. We work with the value chain across OEMs, tier ones, tier twos, government agencies, et cetera. And uh, we are happy to bring forth a team of speakers from three different parts of the world, representing a fairly diverse set of views. Uh, so, we have Manfred who leads the practice globally. Uh, and as a result, uh, whilst he has a wide ambit, uh, has significant focus on aerospace and Europe. I operate out of India and the US and have uh, coverage on land systems and space. And Aditya is based in India uh, and uh, has been engaging in a significant manner in expanding our business there. So without much further ado, I'll first ask Manfred to introduce himself in a little more detail and then take us through the first section. Over to you, Manfred. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Rahul. And um, thank you, Chairman Singh. And uh, I would like to congratulate you and uh, the SIDM team on this event. Um, to hold such an event in these dark times, I think is a great idea. And we would like to thank you uh, for having the opportunity to participate. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, my name is Manfred Harder. Um, as Rahul said, I'm leading our global aerospace and defense practice. Um, as you may know, Roland Berger is uh, active uh, in uh, over 40 countries uh, across the world. Um, the focus of our aerospace and defense practice lies in all major manufacturing and client hubs for aerospace and defense uh, in the world, namely the US and Canada, um, France, UK, 
Germany, Italy, and Europe, um, the Middle East countries around the, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and the UAE, and of course, India um, and uh, China, as far as Asia is concerned. I've been with the firm for the past uh, 22 years. Uh, prior to that, I've been uh, engaged in industry and have focused on, on uh, aerospace and defense for the past uh, 10, uh, 20 years. Um, my current focus lies on uh, advising aerospace uh, uh, OEMs and their supply chain and doing also a lot of work at the interface of both uh, to ensure end of end and sustainable solutions. Aditya? Hi. Yes, so you, yeah, you can hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Aditya Kumar. I work with uh, Roland Berger now for the last couple of years. I've myself spent time in the Indian industry, having worked in the private sector, and then gone ahead and worked with the uh, aerospace and defense OEMs globally. So I come with a large amount of industry experience in the aerospace and defense sector. And I'm here to try and, uh, and we are now trying to expand our uh, you know, knowledge base in the Indian market specifically and expand our presence in the market. I'll let Manfred now take over and take, through, take us through the first initial part of the presentation. Yes, thank you, Aditya. Um, let us begin our, our discussion today um, with an overview of uh, where civil aircraft or commercial aerospace is currently. Yeah. Um, although we want to focus our uh, discussion on, uh, on defense-related matter afterwards, we believe it's opportune and important to have a look at what's going on in this important segment of our, of our market, of our industry. Um, what you see here on this first slide is basically the mechanics on how aerospace industry, and I'm talking about civil aerospace industry here, is really impacted by the COVID crisis. Yeah. It all really starts by, um, I would say, the daily bulletins that all of you receive on the virus progression. Yeah. And it seems like uh, every day some new news is coming in. It's not really clear where this whole thing is leading to. So there's extreme volatility or uncertainty, I would say, at this end. Yeah. Um, the actual, I would say, um, virus progression um, does then um, have implications on any kind of actions done to contain the uh, spread of your virus. Most of all, of course, government restrictions. Uh, I believe all of us, we are still uh, in some kind of lockdown situation. Yeah? Travel is almost not possible currently. Um, and the good news, at least, is that we can have these kind of interactions like today. But other than that, of course, uh, the outlook is very bleak. Yeah? Uh, we will see in a minute uh, that this has um, has produced an almost uh, uh, complete stop to air traffic across the world, yeah, with some exceptions. Yeah. Um, and this has also led to an unprecedented situation of uh, aircraft fleet being grounded, being taken off the market. Um, and we have a very um, stressful situation around the globe currently for airlines fighting for their survival. And obviously, that impact has already hit um, the aerospace industry, because basically all clients are in a distressed situation. Yeah? Although this is an industry with ha which has enjoyed or which enjoys outstanding order books, yeah? there is no industry which has uh, up to 10 years uh, of order book uh, standing. Yeah? We all of a sudden find that these order books may not be worth anything. Because although there's contracts, there's maybe clients on the other side which are neither able uh, nor willing to receive any of those aircraft. Yeah. We see an early effect uh, in the MAO business, which has come already to a, a complete halt or almost complete halt. Yeah. So the effect is starting to be dramatic. Yeah. Uh, we believe it's important to highlight this because while this may not have a direct impact uh, on the defense industry, there is a lot of indirect uh, impacts uh, that will be seen, uh, starting from a um, supply chain, which very often is overarching between uh, civil 
uh, and military aircraft and uh, uh, finishing by uh, governments, which are uh, certainly, I would say, a secure spender for military uh, uh, goods. But uh, at this stage, we do not know yet what F other efforts governments will have to go through to save uh, the, the crisis situation coming out of COVID and how this may impact in the short term, in the midterm, in the long term, also defense spending, which probably will be a uh, quite diff different uh, country by country. But let's have a look at aerospace uh, first and let's move to the next slide. What you're seeing here, don't try to read it in detail, <laughs> it's really do too detailed, uh, is, is a fairly dramatic situation which we have never seen before um, in, the, in, in recent history or in the history of aviation. Basically today, two thirds of the global commercial aircraft fleets are grounded. That corresponds to almost 20,000 aircraft. Yeah? In some uh, regions like Europe, um, like uh, Southeast Asia, uh, to a certain extent also Middle East, it's almost 100% grounding. Uh, the only, uh, only uh, small light at the horizon is, uh, is, uh, is China, which seems to be a little bit ahead of the curve and where air traffic is starting to pick up again. Yeah? But all in all, we see a very dramatic situation today. And as I just said earlier on, um, all those airlines are kind of fighting for survival. Um, some under greater pressure, other under lesser pressure, and they could become uh, sort of winners in a consolidation game that we expect to happen uh, once it's clearer where the crisis is going to take us. If we go to the next slide, um, this takes a look actually at what is happening in China with regards to air traffic, with regards to when the crisis uh, peaked and where we stand today. Uh, I mean, effectively, China is the place where the, the crisis started out or where the uh, infection uh, waves started out. Yeah? And uh, China, as you know, has uh, put in place some drastic measures uh, which allowed them to put under control uh, the infection waves fairly quickly, uh, meaning by the end of February, uh, they more or less had the situation under control. We do not know at this stage to what extent we will see second, third or fourth waves of outbreaks. But for the time being, the situation seems to be under pretty good control, especially also outside uh, of the Wuhan region. Um, what we have seen, though, um, is one, an expected phenomenon, a quick and dramatic drop of air traffic um, in the first two months of the, of the year, where air traffic has come both domestically and internationally almost to a halt. Uh, uh, but we only have seen, I would say, a timid recovery since. I mean, these uh, figures you see here about uh, two weeks old, there has been slight improvement since, uh, but currently we run at around 30 to 40% um, of normal level of air traffic inside of China and virtually zero outside of China, or almost uh, close to zero. Yeah. Um, and what we're seeing is that it doesn't look like a quick recovery uh, back to the old normal level, because there's still a lot of, I would say, reticence about going onto the plane, a lot of discouragement also by the government uh, to have people go onto the plane. And the reason I'm showing this slide is since China is ahead of the curve, it's kind of an early indicator of what will happen everywhere else. I mean, uh, everywhere else we are still, um, at the, at the bottom of the curve, uh, and we have summer periods coming up, uh, especially in Europe and in, in America, which is normally a high season for travel. Um, but I think we can caution ourselves that this may not pick up this quickly again um, before it's not clear how the virus can be put under control in a sustainable manner. Yeah? And uh, as we all know, um, there is not a clear cure for the virus today. And we're discovering day by day that it may take longer than we originally expected for the virus to be under control. And that means that air traffic, which is, I would say, uh, one of the areas most affected uh, by the virus, 
will be, of course, uh, will stay, of course, affected. I did lose the presentation on my screen now. Maybe we can go to the next slide. I don't know if everybody sees the next slide. I do not see it currently. I think we I think we've nope. lost it. It's here. We are not okay. able to see the slide. Okay. Rahul, can you jump in? I will try to put the presentation up. Okay. Um, waiting for this slide. I mean, the, the real question, of course, is, and that is what you will see on the next slide, um, is how long is this crisis going to last for? And um, will we return to some kind of normal? And when will we return to some kind of normal? And the experience uh, from previous crises, uh, this is of course not the first crisis, um, uh, used to tell us uh, two things. Um, one, uh, yes, after each crisis in the past, uh, we managed to get back on track, meaning uh, back to the old uh, level of traffic and back to uh, the old level of growth rate. Yeah. Um, and that took anywhere between six and 12 months. Now, that was a lesson learned from the previous crisis. Um, I still don't see it, Rahul. It, it was uh, on there shortly. Is a, there is a challenge with the WebEx, so it keeps okay. on disconnecting, but just give us a minute. We're trying to put it up. Okay, now let me just continue, and uh, we'll show you the slide afterwards. Um, so we have analyzed the previous crisis uh, to get some, some, I would say, lessons learned for COVID, um, but we find it extremely difficult to align on the previous patterns. Why? Um, current crisis uh, were, uh, previous crisis, uh, sorry, previous crisis were a mixture of different uh, causes uh, or implications of crisis. Um, there could have been economic downturn, like in the oil crisis or um, during the financial crisis. It could have been an element of fear, like during the, the Gulf War or during 9-11. Um, there could have been health risks uh, uh, as triggers, uh, like uh, during the SARS or the, uh, the Mars, uh, MERS crisis. Um, or there could have just have been travel restrictions imposed, also like uh, during the previous SARS crisis. But none, none of those crises in the past um, had actually all of those elements. Uh, this makes it extremely difficult um, to extrapolate from what we have seen in the past into the future. And we believe actually that this is not possible and that we need to find our own ways to get our, our arms around how to, um, how to predict uh, what could come out of this crisis. Um, to this end, um, we have developed our own uh, scenarios. Um, and I can say from the start, we don't have the crystal ball. We just have tried to get our arms around how this, um, how this, uh, uh, how this could look like. And we have developed three scenarios. Um, one which we called rebound, one which we called delayed cure, and one which we called recession. And, um, can you see the screen, Manfred? No. Yeah, now I can see it. Excellent. And uh, you come right at the at the, at the good moment. And uh, we have tried to characterize um, the development of the crisis and the impact on uh, on air traffic uh, along a number of parameters. The first parameter is how long um, will we stay in a lockdown and in, in travel restrictions or elsewise said by when, meaning which flight schedule, summer or winter, this year or next year, will we be back uh, to a functioning air traffic um, for the COVID crisis? So that means, yes, the industry is going to contract, but not by 30 to 50%, but probably by something between 15 and 30%, yeah? which is in line with what Airbus has announced already in terms of at least temporary reduction of rates. And uh, which is a good indicator um, of where the industry may settle on the longer term. 
If we now go to the next slide, and I think here we start uh, to make the connection also now to the defense industry. Um, we believe that this will have a major impact uh, on the industrial landscape. It's effectively, what is going to happen in, uh, in civil aerospace? Um, we are losing scale in the industry, a contraction of 15 to 30 percent. Yeah? Uh, don't expect airlines to have more money than before. So we certainly will not see price increases for aircraft. Uh, that means that basically uh, industrial players will have to compensate the scale they have been losing due to the contraction of the industry by other ways of increasing efficiency. And one way certainly will be um, more consolidation within the supply landscape. We currently see two scenarios. Either suppliers do that among themselves. That is the most likely scenario uh, as long as we find uh, enough cash strong uh, suppliers to do the job or OEMs will have to step in. They will not really want to do this, but they will. They may need to be forced to do it in order to uh, uh, secure or safeguard essential parts of the supply chain. Because the um, overall aerospace supply chain is dependent on certain elements. It cannot be replaced easily due to certification re uh, reasons, due to technological reasons. So there may be that uh, scenario. What this means uh, for defense companies, I think, is twofold. Number one, since many of the suppliers are being shared, at least in your aeronautical uh, supply chain, between uh, uh, civil and military um, applications, you can, of course, very quickly become affected um, by suppliers who have a big share of civil aircraft uh, business in their portfolio and who will be struggling for survival. Yeah, that means. Uh, there could be disruptions of your own supply chain, which you will need to manage. On the other hand, there may be an opportunity for defense companies um, actually taking part in, in, in this consolidation game yeah, um, and stepping in in some of those suppliers uh, and maybe consolidating either your own uh, value chain positioning or um, your own segment. I would now want to hand over to Rahul. Uh, to give you more uh, insights and a deeper, uh, a deeper dive into what this means for defense. Thank you, Manfred. Uh, can 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 you guys hear me, please? Am, am I audible? Yeah, we can hear you, Rahul. Okay, perfect. So, essentially, we look at the business and say there are suppliers which have focus on civil aerospace and focus on aftermarket and some also are focused on defense. And if we plot the global grid into essentially a two by two matrix, uh, we come across a situation where we are seeing maximum pressure to be on suppliers in the upper right hand corner. Uh, so suppliers that have a high degree of focus on civil aerospace, a high degree of focus on aftermarket, they would face the maximum pressure on their business. Uh, these would be followed by suppliers in the lower right-hand corner. They, they would be the second set of players who would have challenges, followed by the upper left corner and then the lower left corner. So if you look at how uh, the stress will get transmitted in the system through value chains, this is what it would reflect in. And this is important for a defense industry that's building itself not only for local manufacture and supply, but also for export. Uh, if we move forward by one slide, and we start looking at defense in, in this more conventional sense now, we essentially see six different trends playing out. The first trend is delay in spends. Uh, this may and, and the word delay is, is a wider word being used here. These, these could mean slippages. These can mean contractions. These can also mean a switch from new capital equipment into life extension of capital equipment. And that's a discussion that, that we're starting to have with some of the global defense OEMs which are operating. The second is, uh, as, as was evident in some of the earlier discussions, there is a supply chain overlap that 
defense as a sector has with aerospace for civil and military aerospace part. It has with automotive on the land systems part, and it has with project engineering with the, on the naval manufacturing part. Now, all these three elements of overlap, whether it's civil aerospace, whether it's automotive, or whether it's project engineering, they are all significantly impacted by COVID. So there would be a supply chain impact that defense as a sector is expected to see. Uh, there is a disruption in the export models that will happen, and uh, this is true for OEMs operating out into emerging markets, but also, let's be fair, uh, for Indian companies that are now positioning themselves as OEMs, emerging markets are the target export destination. So there would be a need to redo those models as well. Lower availability of people, uh, of workforce, will disrupt manufacturing processes per se. Uh, one interesting trend, which might actually be positive, is over time we've seen uh, technology pressures uh, really crippling the defense industry. So if you take, for example, a land systems platform uh, and break it down into three broad categories, mobility, firepower, and mission systems, uh, we have found that in the category of mission systems, which was uh, for a higher value land systems platform, a normal personal carrier or something like that, which used to range between 10 to 12% of the value of the platform in late 70s, early 80s is now A. Mission systems is upwards of 40, 45% of the value of the platform. But most importantly, what's happening there is technology cycles are today shorter than procurement cycles by a factor of two. So while the procurement cycle is taking eight to 10 years, technology is changing two times in that period. And as a result, QRs are not stable across defense platforms. And this is not just an India specific problem, it's, it's happening all over the world. But what COVID will do is, or what we expect it to do is, people will be forced to stay on the same level of technology for a little while longer. So for defense companies, it gives them some sort of a breather on the technology space. Last of all, we are seeing realignment of government spends. I think there's already, uh, there would be a push to allocate spends a little bit differently in the category. But let's look at some of these trends in a little more uh, deeper perspective. Most countries we are seeing on this chart are already seeing defense spend contraction. Their Contraction is not only a function of uh, their own COVID impact, but also a function of the overall economic situation that they find themselves in. So Saudi Arabia, for example, with the massive oil crisis that's also concurrently happening in terms of the pricing, is seeing significantly neg erosion on defense spend. It's much less for some other countries. Uh, some of them are. In, in a far worse of situation. In our business, specifically for India, we've also realized one thing that spends as a number can be quite misleading because the government may not spend the money. It may allocate the money in the budget, but it may essentially return the budget at the end of the year. So the number will sit, but the number may not translate into orders placed on the industry. And that's an added complexity that needs to be factored in when you're dealing with this. Overall, we are seeing this to result in uh, order book slippage of anywhere between one year to two years, 14 to 22 months. Again, the situation can be quite drastic on some programs, could be higher than 22 months, and on some other programs, it could be less. We, this, this trend has also been uh, validated on categories like land systems, which have very, very strong correlation defense uh, business. Now, when it comes to exports, uh, and this is important because we also have OEMs on the call for whom India is still a campaign-led market or, a, or, or, or a, with some deeper engagement on manufacture. We have Indian groups on the call here, Bharat Forge, LNT, um, Godrej, which will be primes in expected uh, Leyland, Ashok Leyland, which will be primes on 
emerging markets for platforms. Uh, and you take the global spend on exports in the last 10 years, we find disproportionate part of that export has actually happened to emerging or markets or developing countries. This is true for everybody. Now, in these markets, uh, one, price considerations are important, and that's why that used to give heart to some of the manufacturing which was happening out of India to say we would be well positioned in these markets. Uh, but these, are, these markets are also markets where there is a significant impact on jobs. Uh, so for OEMs, whether they are Indian OEMs or whether they are global OEMs, for developing markets, we believe the approach for exports will move away from a basket of factors where technology used to play a big role, price used to play a big role, to an, a basket of factors where in-country job creation will play as much of a role as cost does. Now, it's important to take a minute here and go back into our COVID scenario. The, the resultant government behavior is not the same across the world as a response to COVID scenario. So for example, countries in Europe, France and Germany uh, as examples are giving substantial wage benefits to their, uh, to their enterprises. Uh, in, in some countries, it ranges from 70 to 80% for a period of up to two years. That should, in the long run, build additional competitiveness to products from these parts of the world and will take away uh, the element of price competitiveness that Indian exports used to have. So to compensate that also, creation of jobs through in-country joint ventures will become a key factor when you're making campaign-led approaches. Space as a business has been relatively globally more resilient in this crisis. In fact, some segments, because all of us are spending more time on communication and more time at home, are actually seeing growth. Uh, at com, uh, is seeing growth, communication is seeing growth, uh, observation is seeing growth. There are some other sectors that are slightly depressed. For example, science and ex exploration is, uh, is a sector that we feel will get impacted by budgetary constraints globally. But this as a sector is relatively stable. Uh, on this sector, the factors that could impact are, of course, supply chain disruption, footprint relocation, and there would be a greater challenge to new space players who are trying to make a play in this segment uh, because they would have far weaker business cases to establish. Now, let's look at it from an India perspective. From an India perspective, uh, the economy is stable and is slightly better positioned than some of the other economies in the world. We're seeing projections that are fairly consistently negative for the rest of the world. In India's case, we are seeing projections that are saying growth will be at 1% to 2%, which is, which is not great, uh, considering that as, an, as a country, as a population, we are growing and for the, for the base that we are. But it's still one of those regions that still is in the positive territory. Uh, there are some underlying factors that are important here. There is an underlying market that has not gone away, which is largely consumption-driven a segment that will not get impacted so much. There is reasonable reserves with the government, and the rupee is relatively a stable currency. It's not, it's, it's a managed float in that way. Uh, the, there is political certainty in the country, and the ratings have largely oscillated around a B to A kind of a level. So they've, they've been in the same narrow band that they've been operating. Uh, all of that would have, in traditional sense, placed us in a position where we would have said, look, uh, India's demand, domestic demand, is good enough, and so once the crisis is over, the demand will come back, and hence that should not result in any uh, contraction or any holdback from the government on other sectors where spending is needed, where defense is a big piece. 
but that's not true. I think for the first time in the last many years, there are serious question marks on how deep is the rot on the demand side. And as a result, we do expect the government to be cautious across on spending. And caution in spending will result in two or three things. One, uh, programs will get delayed. Two, they will not spend. And three, they will return back to them. However, this will impact different players differently. DPSUs have a reasonable order book currently. They may not, they may still be able to show the same levels of turnover basis the existing order book that they're carrying, but they have an issue in terms of profitability that they will be able to show. And so this will impact marginally on profitability. Uh, they will have some impact on the supply chain because uh, to their credit, uh, Having a local supply chain today is proving a benefit rather than a uh, mistake. Uh, export models, they don't, they're not exporting too much, so limited disruption there. Manufacturing processes, yes, it could disrupt, but still, let's understand uh, the DPSU and the Ordnance Factory Manufacturing Network is not largely in urban India. It's, a, it, it's off city for most cases. So as long as those clusters do not get contaminated, the situation will be managed. They will face an easing out of technology pressures. Yes, there would be spend realignment away from defense, more to homeland security, et cetera. But that will only impact at mid midterm, so they, they would find themselves okay. The Indian private sector may have a slightly weaker position. Uh, let's understand the Indian private sector grew up around DPSUs. So having a industry that's predominantly supplied to DPSUs is now starting to export. The export piece will, will be worrisome. The DPSU piece will still be stable. So a little bit of risk. Uh, risk would be higher where Indian private sector is acting as a prime. Uh, the challenge is most of India's private sector defense value chain is self-financed and is technopreneur driven money. In that kind of a situation with worsening cash positions, we could face significant erosion of capability. Because very frankly, for, we are also not an economy like uh, some of the Western economies where industry is being bankrolled and supported in a significant manner in this crisis. So the, the cash position worsening will be a big issue. Export models, uh, disruption will be a key issue. Manufacturing processes, now here there's, there's a fine twist. If you look at India's private sector defense value chain, it's not off city, but it's largely in urban centers. So Hyderabad, Bangalore, uh, in and around Delhi, uh, Pune, these are large clusters, but they are all urban clusters. And hence there is greater disruption that this value chain will face. Technology pressure is out will benefit but it'll take time to percolate. And spend realignment, yes, of course, midterm issues will come. Foreign OEMs are facing with reduced spend, so big issue for them in India. Their global supply chains are disrupted, so they will have challenges on sourcing from India. Uh, they will need to realign their export models. There will be disruption for them on manufacturing processes. Uh, where OEMs that were pitching on technology against DPSUs, that lever will diminish a little bit. So they would need to find some other tools uh, to compensate that. And reallocation for spends will result in all parties needing to redo their portfolios. That leads us to what we believe are six key actions that each set of entities need to work on. And some of these might conflict with each other because that's the nature of our industry. The OEM interests are sometimes not aligned with Indian industry interests, but together they, they, uh, they have to be balanced out. Across the board, health and safety is primarily operational criteria right now, but that's a short-term measure. And I think everybody is addressing it, whether it's OEMs, whether it's Indian companies, whether it's DPSUs. For OEMs, the big issue is about revisiting their country business plan and they will need their boards to get buy-in for these country business plans because 
uh, they would need more cash support from their boards. They will need to revisit campaign approaches uh, to refocus on the local job creation part. There would be a revisit in time on the footprint issue because local joint ventures will become more attractive and more uh, visible vehicles. Uh, local sourcing will need to be revisited because you do not have, as Manfred explained, for civil aerospace, uh, enough demand for your products from the global supply chain. So that, 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 the, there is a squeeze there. So how do you address the local sourcing piece? That's an issue. And tech transfer arrangements will have to be uh, revisited because there is a, you, you will free up a lot, many, much more global technology which can be transferred to India simply because there are more pieces of technology that are now viable and will remain viable for a longer period of time. The Indian companies, on contrast, will have to A, revisit their business plans because uh, some plans may not be viable for the next four to five years. They have worsening cash position. For them, strengthening OEM relationship becomes even more important right now in the current context because they need to ensure that the business survives. They will need to push the government for greater localization. That's just it is a political message, it is a lobbying position, but Indian industry will push for it. Uh, they will try to push for reallocation of funds, uh, but how possible is that has to be estimated. So uh, orders that were being placed outside in terms of uh, global buy to be shifted to local purchases. And somehow or the other, well, this is still not a topic that has been brought in, the Indian industries will need to push for government wage subsidy uh, support. Because look, if let's assume COVID was not happening and the Western economies decided to support their defense manufacturing industry with 60, 70, 80% wage support, that would have amounted to a WTO violation and there would have been a case filed against it. Today, nobody will file a case because that's expected for economies to do that and better placed economies with, low, with slightly more advanced infrastructures will support more their industries than emerging economies like India. That changes the competitiveness dynamic. That changes the way products are priced. That changes the cost base of products. And hence, for equitable parity, Indian industry will need to seek significant wage subsidy support from their government. I don't think we should spend too much time on DPSUs and what they would do. Uh, but these were some of the initial thoughts that are starting to uh, fructify as we go through this COVID impact. We remain available uh, for any support. Uh, so Manfred, Marcel, Aditya, uh, the entire aerospace defense team of Goldenberger comprising of over 100 professionals in, in a network of 2,500 people across the world, working with some of the best in the world, are happy to assist you in trying to find answers or trying to find solutions in this time of crisis, as always. So thank you so much for the opportunity. Over to uh, the organizers at SIDM. Hello. Yes, thank you, we Rahul. We hear you, so you're on mute. Sorry. Thank you, Rahul and uh, Manfred for that uh, presentation. In indeed, was uh, quite extensive and elucidated on a very important point. Uh, so moving forward, I will now invite uh, Commodore Bunty Sethi from UK BC to share his comments. Uh, Commodore Sethi, uh, you are just being unmuted and you can go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes, you're audible. Okay. Uh, thank you, sir, for this opportunity to speak. Uh, uh, good evening, gentlemen. Uh, a lot has already been said, so I'll uh, just try and keep my remarks as brief as possible. Uh, it, you will all agree that India is managing COVID-19 quite effectively and expected to be one of the few economies to emerge positively from the pandemic. 
the forecasted that in the next decade it will be one of the top 5 global economies and is well positioned to assume a greater leadership role in southeast asia to present a sector agnostic adverse effect of covid-19 crisis results of a survey for which 400 ceos were polled showed that 32% businesses have had high impact due to covid-19 21% have had medium and the rest have had low impact or no impact at all cash flow for 84% businesses has reduced 10% has increased and 6% saw no effect at all Uh, the biggest challenges all industry sectors are facing are related to mitigating costs weak demand due to decline in economic activity and supply chain management as far as uh, the defense industry is concerned uh, uh, there are four key responses that we got from uh, from uh, most industries firstly there is sig- significant insecurity in the industry as budget priority pa- policies and strategy focus is changing and will continue to change for- for at least the next 2 years and possibly many ongoing capital acquisition plans may get deferred indefinitely secondly india has been under lockdown for march 25th and re- will remain so till march 3rd but since 21st april some areas which have not been badly hit by the pandemic have been granted permission to open up therefore it is anticipated by that by july august production and utilization levels will reach 70% and it is only after september that it is expected that there will be a 90 to 100% utilization rate subject of course to the growth of covid cases thirdly uh, the uh, a big challenge uh, for msmes will be managing supply chains and uh, lastly it is expected that complete revival of msmes will require at least 6 to 12 months uh, to sum up as far as the defense industry is concerned the u- unique nature of defense industry with government being the buyer will play out as government policies outlook and on ground situation develops region by region factors like existing financial reserves of a nation the government's focus on social and health sector and near closing defense deals of critical nature will all play together to define the defense industry uh, going forward uh, that's all from my side uh, thank you sir Thank you, uh, Commodore Bunty, for your uh, comments. May I now request Rodrigo from the Brazilian Defense Industry Association to share his uh, remarks, please. Hello. Uh, good afternoon for you all. Uh, I think, uh, as mentioned by Commodore, most of the thing has been very well covered by by our colleagues from Ron Berger. so it's uh, even difficult to to comment more on the on the on the current situation and the market itself so here i i just would like to put a few uh, insights uh, in terms of what our association is doing here in brazil that might be worth sharing uh, as you know uh, here in brazil we have a very heterogeneous uh, defense industrial base we're not a huge defense country so that said we have small companies and also big players so in this what we are doing here and might be a good insight to be disseminated between all of you is we are using the big players to share their knowledge with local companies sharing their practice like AHEs a HST governance rules and procedures that for small companies a few months ago was something considered excessive and not essential for their operation so this is uh, one thing that could be worth sharing yeah so this the idea is that we keep the small companies uh, running and we avoid uh, the disruption of the global uh, local um, supply chain one thing that uh, maybe it's also worth saying as well is that here more and more we are trying to coordinate the activities so we have also created a, a working group with the the association and the companies which is fully in line with the Brazilian MOD and the national health system to try to use our industrial base the the defense industrial base uh to facilitate co- 
collaboration between companies and meet the demands of the development. So, as most most of the of the topics has been addressed, I think that would be be all from from our side here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rodrigo, for those comments. Uh, indeed, great to know that uh, you have formed a task force for uh, an industrial cooperation between industry and the government in India. Also, uh, you know, SIDM has been doing the same. Uh, before I open it uh, up to questions, Chairman, uh, is there anything that you would like to add? unmuted now yes so no i think it, it it's been uh, covered uh, very well uh, by by ronel berger and, and uk bc so we can have the open session now and if anything is there we can take it on so chairman so, uh, for quick question and answers i would request all uh, pa uh, participants to click on the raise hand button which is there it is right next to your name in the uh, on your attendee list so click on that we will get a notification over here and i will unmute you so, so that you can ask your question initially in the chat box we had commodore mukesh bhargava who has already posted the question so i request commodore bhargava to uh, ask the question just unmuting him Uh, my question is to Rahul. Uh, I can see what uh, he's speaking about uh, the challenges which are there on the disruption of supply chain with the foreign OEMs. We already have lots of orders committed to the foreign OEMs where the supplies were due in this financial year. As I can see with this disruption of the supply chain, for the foreign OEM, those deliveries would not be possible to be made. They will shift to the right, maybe to the FY22. So in the FY21, whatever is the budget allocation that is there, would it not be prudent for that to be diverted for domestic procurement rather than from the foreign OEMs? And uh, look at uh, orders which can be given to the MSMEs and SMEs uh, so that the, the stress that is being faced by the Indian industry can be elevated. At the same time, the money can be fruitfully utilized. Your views, Rahul, on that. Uh, pleasure talking yes. to you, Commander Bhargava. Uh, you, Rahul. There are, can, can you hear us? Can you hear, can you hear me? I can hear you, go ahead. Okay. So, uh, two parts, three parts actually to that answer. In principle, from an Indian industry perspective that is the pitch that needs to be made to the government there is a question mark on is it viable or is it possible for the government to switch orders specially committed liabilities or orders that were given to a certain party on a nomination basis or a certain party on a selection basis uh, those are contractual issues which we will leave the government to try to find an answer to. Uh, so that's on the intent piece. On the capability piece, I think the Indian supply chain, which appears okay right now, uh, and which is trying to deliver work, will need to be uh, also uh, supported by primes like yourself, maybe even supporting consolidation in this Indian supply chain. Because while large companies are fine at tier two, tier three levels, the supply chain is reasonably distressed on cash today. So there may be a case, and, and that's what, if, if we go back to the slide that Mansad had presented, the supplier consolidation landscape which is which will expect it to play out in the aerospace supply chain in the rest of the world. 
I think COVID is a good trigger to do that in India also to ensure a supply chain that's below primes like yourself, which is of significant size, capability, and sustainability. So intent-wise, from an Indian perspective, yes, uh, absolutely. Uh, is it doable? Has to be seen. But you would need to do some pre-work to ensure that your supply chain below you is ramped up in this time of crisis to absorb that kind of risk. Uh, my, my question was not for assigning or transferring the orders from the foreign OEM to the industry. My question was related to assigning the funds allocated for the payment to foreign OEMs against deliveries which may not happen could be utilized for uh, promoting the by Indian IDDM and the MSME orders. Thanks for answering that. Thank you, Rahul. I, I would hope that happens. I, I really, I'm wishing that happens. My fear is uh, they will hold back the spend on the foreign OEMs because the foreign OEMs are not able to deliver, but they will return that money back to the government <laughs> and <laughs> spend rather than transferring it to Indian industry. You know, That's a pity. Thank you, Rahul. May I request any other questions? If, if you have, you may type it out also in the chat box and I can put you on as a, as a speaker, then you can ask your questions. Uh, as of now, I do not see any hands raised. Uh, so uh, if there is anyone who is unable to do so, you may uh, type out their uh, question in the chat box. Either we were very convincing or we were horrible in our performance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but, but, but our offer to support any of you remains. Please feel free to reach out to any of us. Uh, and, and, you know, whilst, you, whilst it's well established that consultants are considered the lowest form of life because we work only for commercial gain, but we'd be happy to engage in a dialogue with any of you on this topic oh. uh, and explore how we could work together. Yeah, just one minute, uh, Mr. Rahul. We have Mr. Uh, Chanavas uh, Sirkoli uh, with his hands up. Yes. Down to that. Uh, uh, Avnish. Yes, I'm unmuting. Mr. Chanavas. And we've got Kushal Dange, who's, uh, who's got a question. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Sirkoli, you're unmuted. Please go ahead. Yeah, uh, very good evening, and uh, it was really great session. Uh, session, and uh, uh, the thing is, uh, uh, you quite summarized uh, very well on the uh, upcoming industries. My question is, uh, you know, uh, to Manfred uh, either, uh, yeah, the two main uh, uh, scenarios. If in, uh, I'm talking about the perspective of India, uh, mainly air structures, engines. Uh, uh, support is more or more uh, um, from the India region, and uh, how how you will see uh, the impact uh, of, of this uh, COVID-19 uh, towards these scenarios, uh, specifically towards the uh, you know, side and uh, engine side. Now the line was a little bit bad. I'm not quite sure if I captured completely. I understand. Uh, um, what is the effect of uh, um, of COVID-19 specifically on segments like aerostructures and engine in India? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> I mean, um, aerostructures, you have to look, I would say, the wider um, uh, uh, wider play uh, on a global basis. Uh, and here we have a couple of, um, of facts that need to, to be taken as a basis. Uh, number one, uh, the industry is still fairly fragmented. The biggest player, which is uh, Spirit Aerospace, uh, holds uh, maybe six or seven percent of the world market, yeah, and the top twenty uh, hold maybe eighty percent, um, uh, plus a, a, a large number of smaller players, especially detailed parts uh, area, which uh, which take the rest. Yeah? So this is the prime segment, really, where we would expect consolidation to take place, since many other segments, as for example engines, yeah. Uh, are much more consolidated already. Yeah. So here I would say um, 
it is an opportunity for Indian companies to look out what's happening in uh, in Europe, uh, what's happening in North America, yeah? uh, and it could be an opportunity also um, to climb up uh, the value chain uh, by making thoughtful investments. Yeah? Since we have companies will be in trouble, and which may look, need to look for um, financial aid, financial support. Yeah? We've recently done, just to give you an example, we've recently done uh, um, a study in the German market. Uh, trying to depict um, by when um, SME type players in the aeronautical industry um, will run out of cash. Uh, and despite gov government money uh, measures like uh, short time work, for example, uh, this will be latest in October on average, uh, if not additional help is coming in. Uh. So I think it's a good time to survey the market and see uh, where they could be fitting, um, fitting um partners for you yeah um, and to also assess would be the right timing uh, to do any kind of uh, of operation any kind of action yeah? um, coming to the engine market i mean um you you, you cannot sort of um, look at the engine market without looking at the engine mro market yeah? and what we're seeing today is as i said earlier on um we see uh, uh, two thirds of the fleet um, grounded, yeah? potentially even more in the coming weeks, which of course is an immediate hit uh, to engine MRO. And M engine MRO is a, is a key element of each engine's uh, maker's business model. Yeah? So uh, this means while uh, on average, the whole industry is of course uh, uh, strongly fragilized uh, by what we're seeing in the, uh, in the COVID-19 uh, development, yeah? Um, engine uh, engine companies, due to their um, high MRO content or high MRO dependency in their business model, will be hit even worse. Uh, uh, which then, of course, means that uh, if you are a supplier to a, um, to, a, to one of the large uh, engine OEMs or to their supply chain, um, expect to be in for a bumpy ride. Um, in terms of uh, a client which uh, very quickly needs to stop its own bleeding, yeah, which will then translate into a, a clear stoppage of orders uh, towards you. Th thank you. So um, I'm putting Mr. Kushal Dung as uh, the next uh, uh, quest from the next question. So Mr. Dung, you're unmuted now. Yeah, uh, thank you so much. Uh, we have actually, what we've been doing over the last one hour or so is more like crystal, gla uh, crystal gazing. Uh, while uh, Manfred has covered the aerospace part of uh, the, the crystal, Rahul tried to cover the defense part of the crystal, and uh, uh, Commodore Bhargav asked a very uh, pertinent question about funds, the diversion of funds, if at all that is going to be possible. So I really don't have a question but it's more like a comment that ultimately this will, the uh, entire scenario will play out uh, depending on the priorities of the Indian government and equally of any other government across the world. Uh, if, if, we had, if the government wants to prioritize defense and uh, defense manufacturing, defense uh, procurements, uh, all, that, all that would, uh, we, we, we would get the value out of it only when there is such a priority given by the government. Otherwise, we really don't have hold over it. Yes, we will. We are trying to network ourselves between ourselves and trying to arrive at a logical uh, perspective. But ultimately, it is the government that has to take a call between prioritizing defense over. Uh, surely, they can't prioritize defense over the over the social sector, which is which remains the government's prime priority. And likewise, uh, this is going to happen across the world. So uh, that's all. That's the only comment I had to say. Uh, it, I, it really is not a question. Thank you. So Rahul, this is Amandeep Desai. You raised a very interesting perspective on the technology that this may be an you know opportunity or or this may lead to a delay in technological advancement which the customer or may ask for right? do you think that happening in india or will it be just be uh, taken as another way 
to delay uh, you know certain projects because then they'll get more time uh, to get along see in some categories of business uh, today levels of technology in civil businesses is ahead of the level of technology in defense businesses for example uh, some types of communication miniaturization etc etc uh, those segments will get a breather uh, what would be the intent for the government to do it uh, i don't think the intent will be to use it as a delay tactic yes it can always be used as a delay tactic but i think it actually gives a breather to players who were finding that obsolescence was hitting their product category much faster and before you could even commercialize a product in the defense space uh, obsolescence was wiping competitiveness away so i think it will give a breather for it, everybody if there is a genuine case there which is sitting there yeah thank you i think i think rahul you also want to add over there about what we talking about how upgrades and this is going to be something that we'll see far more that how upgrades are going to be potentially playing a much larger role in the system yeah. than actually moving on to newer platforms so if you want to just elaborate a bit on that yeah, so our discussions with some uh, oems uh, on smaller systems uh, smaller platforms is tending to show that there is a push also in some other economies of moving away from new capital purchase to life extension of existing equipment so replacement demand is getting re uh, switched by life extension projects it is something that we believe will also play up in india in some way uh, you may not want to replace your existing fleet with a new product but go in for modernization and i think that also linking back to commodore bargava's case and position that also plays to the benefit of indian industry because those sorts of modernization projects are great for a in work share to be given to indian industry two for indian industry to get developed capability on a much wider array of platforms it's it's already wide but you can you can really start understanding and playing the role of local oem much better with viable business cases if the underlying principle here is the government has to support local defense industry with order book because if that does not happen then all of our discussion is essentially a waste because we are essentially in a case where there's only one buyer for this industry now just to support your point under the make two category the upgrades have been added and that is uh, amongst one of the top procurement categories and with a shorter time frame so the point that i was making can probably be utilized to upgrade programs as well as aditya is rightly brought out thank you Got it. Hi, this is uh, Raghu here from Nandan GSC in Bombay. We do work in aviation and uh, defence vehicles. So my question is that uh, you know maintenance as a aspect was already one of the least priorities in a lot of uh, consumers in aviation as well as in defence. Do you think with the budget uh, cuts? or uh, with the strains that are coming that is going to be something that is going to be of uh, concern because if they don't maintain things properly the cause of accidents could be a lot more in the future so is there something that can be put up into that and number two is of course you uh, talked about it briefly but do you think that uh, there could be an offshore manufacturing potential in india and if that's the case how do you recommend we go about it thanks in the interest of time uh, mr jagdish i i would because these are questions that will require elaborate answers i'm happy to have a between aditya myself we are happy to have a discussion with you uh, on the
the sidelines for this because i think we are also running out of time on this on this got it i already sent both of you linkedin requests so i'll catch up with you there perfect thanks looking for yeah. right uh, next we have mr vinit choudhury mr choudhury i'm putting you on uh, unmute thank you uh uh, Vineet Chaudhary, we are in the uh, from TTGA Private Limited. We are in the aerospace, defense aerospace, and uh, uh, armored vehicles in the uh, military and paramilitary forces. My question is to Rahul. Uh, first of all, the presentation that both of you, uh, Mr. Manfred, and you made was uh, immaculate, uh, giving uh, the different possible scenarios in civil aviation. Uh, of course, the th in each uh, slide you've shown three scenarios, but I, uh, in light of my question is that in light of the fact that two of the global airlines have filed bankruptcy already, I know two, maybe in the world market, there are more than that. In light of that, do you really feel that yes, we have this positive uh, scenarios, even the first one, which is just 4%, then 23%, and then uh, 48%, uh, would, does the, does the whole scenario look that by the time anything really starts to happen, we may have another 5, 7, 10 bankruptcies, and then we don't know what the industry is in for. I'm happy to answer that one. I mean, again, as I said earlier on, uh, first of all, we're trying to get our arms around this almost from a mathematical point of view. And uh, as you rightly indicate, uh, those scenarios uh, are already four weeks old and we don't believe in the first one anymore either. Yeah? Because I think uh, time is sold that the lockdowns and travel restrictions will take longer. And as we move along, we, we see that uh, new evidence is coming up every day, which points towards uh, longer travel restrictions, longer disturbance of uh, air travel. So, inevitably, there will be uh, bankruptcies of airlines, although um, I would say the default scenario is that governments bail out uh, their airlines, but we do believe there will be consolidation in the market. Uh, consolidation in the market basically means that aircraft which belong to one airline, which is bankrupt, will move on to another, another airline. The essential question is, um, what will be the new normal of air traffic in the future? That is indeed, as I explained earlier on, quite hard to tell today. Yeah. We currently believe it will be somewhere between scenario two and scenario three, uh, with the related impact um, on the manufacturing industry. Yeah. But uh, in all honesty, it's too early to really tell um, where we will end up. Uh, so uh, at this stage, all of us can only think in scenarios. Uh, that's what the, the, the large OEMs are doing. That's what the, the supply chain is lining on. But uh, honestly speaking, we all need to think and plan for the worst at this stage. As a follow through question, uh, once this consolidation happens, do you see that the, it's a technical question, that the airlines will reconfigure aircrafts to uh, keep this aspect of social distancing? Because today commercial aircrafts are badly, uh, you know, uh, density of seats is very high and people are cramped between each other. There is hardly leg rooms in economy classes. So this social distancing will become a way of life and maybe the same aircrafts actually will carry 50% or 40% of passengers as they do now? Yeah. This is, of course, a key question. Yeah. Personally, I don't believe that we will be able or will want to manage it at the aircraft side in the, in the immediate or near-term future. Uh, why? First of all, any, I would say, major changes you do within the aircraft uh, will require certification, which takes time and money, and uh, which I think is uh, out of scope to, um, uh, to solve this. And secondly, if you introduce real social distancing, like, like for example, keeping the, the middle seat uh, free, uh, which even would not be a good solution, yeah? that, meets, uh, that means that you would have a, a much uh, lower load factor 
yeah. that would mean that uh, aircraft uh, or air ticket prices would have to go up uh, consequentially, which would kill the industry on another uh, on another uh, front. Yeah. So um, we believe, although the industry is still struggling with uh, coming uh, out with, a, I would say, a comprehensive measure package, which also is, I would standardize, say, standardized globally, but we believe this has to be solved uh, outside of the aircraft uh, by pre-selection of passengers, for example, yeah, or by measures, measures of equipping passengers um, with masks and other uh, devices. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Due to the paucity of time, we'll just yes. take uh, two more questions. So uh, we so, have. Sorry, I, I'll have to excuse myself. Uh, I'll have to excuse myself, Abhinesh, uh, because we are running out of time. So uh, I'm. We are more. Uh, from my side personally, I'm more than happy to uh, answer any questions. Uh, may, maybe directly on a one-to-one -one basis. Would apply for me and for Aditya. Okay, yeah. so uh, uh, with that in uh, uh, mind, uh, uh, may I ask, would it be best idea just to give the concluding remarks so that we can uh, close the session? Thank you, thank you, Avnish. I hope you can hear me. Okay, uh, good evening once again to everyone. And uh, uh, I, I think we have actually run out of time. And uh, all that I can say is it was a privilege for uh, SIDM to host uh, Roland Berger, Berger uh, UKIBC, and Abimde for this webinar. And it was really an insightful presentation made by uh, 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 the Roland uh, Berger team, consisting of uh, uh, Mr. Manfred uh, Eder, Mr. Rahul Gangwal, and Aditya Kumar. I think it was it was uh, great knowing all that, and it was also good to know that uh, India stands a better chance because of some disadvantages that it had in the past. And at the same time, I think uh, the cash flow issues and uh, the other issues of uh, orders and all remain a worry for us. Uh, revisiting of business plans, yes, most of us have. As far as SITM is concerned, uh, gentlemen, uh, we have been at it ever since this uh, pandemic took off. And uh, uh, on the very, even when uh, the uh, lockdown had not started, we had uh, gone to the extent of making a recommendation to the government and uh, thereafter getting the Secretary DP on board. Uh, on the Secretary of Defense on board and discussing it one on one with everyone with the industry. And uh, immediately actions were taken to relax on many fronts, including orders, uh, you know, the RFP, the, uh, the tenders delayed, the, uh, uh, the uh, trials delayed, everything was done at the uh, uh, while on the webinar we were talking. And uh, later on, we followed it up with a very detailed. Uh, 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 you know, recommendation to the government, which they followed up to a large extent. And now we have gone to them back with an exit strategy for post COVID uh, economy of the country. And uh, most of the uh, issues that were covered today in the presentation were talked about, were uh, given out as concrete, uh, you know, steps and concrete uh, recommendations, including this wage subsidy, the localization, reallocation of funds. Uh, and like uh, Commodore Mukesh Bhargav said, you know, uh, diverting some of these funds from the uh, foreign, uh, these things which may uh, not be able to uh, materialize. So all that has been done. And also we have gone to the extent of trying to use the idle capacity of the, of the uh, defense industry to, uh, to produce items healthcare items for the uh, for fighting this uh, covid pandemic and that has worked fantastically well people with the defense industry getting into making of ventilators of uh, personal protective equipment while their companies while while there was a lockdown on and uh, also to help uh, as you know sidm has got a, a major uh, representation of the msmes and for them uh, we have gone in for a consultative forum where we are helping them out uh, with with uh, talking to them and uh, either collectively or individually for problems that uh, they may be having and uh, very soon we are doing a msme conclave where we are meet we are uh, 
exposing all the MSMEs to all the uh, you know, customer base of the country, including the MOD, the service headquarters, the ordnance factories, DFD, DPSUs, the DRDO, uh, everyone. So uh, that's going to be a good event. And uh, at the end, uh, let me thank everyone. Uh, let me thank all the uh, panelists. Let me thank Mr. Manfred Harder, Mr. Ba Mr. Rahul Gangwal, Aditya Kumar, Commodore Banti Sethi, Mr. Rodrigo Madogno, uh, and all the uh, panelists and all the uh, participants that were there. A special thank to the chairman of the SIDM uh, International and uh, Exports Committee, Mr. Amandeep Singh, for taking his time out and uh, uh, sitting through this entire uh, presentation and making very valuable comments uh, in the beginning and while answering the questions. Thank you very much. And we hope to keep this, uh, 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 you know, this uh, interaction with SIDM on in the days to come. Thank you very much. And good evening. And have a great day. Thank you, Bhattar. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for your time. Hopefully, you enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Bye -bye. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much.